Welcome to the Influential CEO. This is where visionary founders become revolutionary leaders, elevating your legacy of impact while enjoying the ride. Welcome to another episode of the Influential CEO Podcast. I'm your host, Stacey Rasky. And of course, be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a review on your favorite platform or simply download the Influential app. Have this podcast right in your pocket. I'm so excited for today's guest and the amazing conversation we are going to be having. Welcome, Sarah Furness. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. You are so welcome. I'm excited because I very rarely meet people who use similar language that I do in reference to our uh, emotional baggage, the emotional constipation, the, you know, understanding the, the energetics of masculine feminine energy. And since you are also such a, just a, a badass alpha woman and powerful coach and practitioner. Um, it just absolutely made sense to have you on. And I, I'm so excited for our chat today. But before we get into all the juicy goodness, I would love for you to take a moment and introduce yourself. Tell us a bit about a bit about what you do, who you serve, how you serve them. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I have a six-year-old son who's desperately trying to make an appearance today. So please <laughs> you'll have to just bear with um, he just it's all good. doing a handoff. That's why. Um, <laughs> although he is part of the story, so who do I serve? Um, or how did I get started? I'll start. I'll start there. So I was in the RAF, the Royal Air Force, for twenty years um, as a helicopter pilot, which was absolutely brilliant. You know, went to places like Iraq, Afghanistan, and uh, you know, very uh, just just an amazing, um, amazing life and experience. And sort of during that time, I suppose I had my ups and downs and had my own, um, my own struggles, I suppose. And I, I think um, I probably struggled a bit with who I was and, and how I fitted in. And, and probably, I think self-loathing was a word that came up for me, you know, in my own kind of eternal monologue. And I tried all sorts of things to be able to kind of come to terms with these thoughts and feelings flying around and ultimately mindfulness just it just fit it, it was just a fantastic tool for me and it really kind of made a lot of sense so after that I thought you know what I'm probably not the only one that goes through these kind of things and on the surf on the outside we look like strong confident people who've got it all figured out but actually there's probably more people out there who are you know like me so I thought right I'm going to go and set up a business um so that's what I did um so I serve you know strong alphas essentially who you know on the outside look like they've got it all figured out but on the inside we all have doubts and fears and um I, I just think that mindfulness is an amazing tool that I would like everyone to have but I particularly resonate with people like me who think they're tough but secretly <laughs> lie awake at night wondering if they're getting it all wrong that is absolutely amazing. And, you know, I love that we're both, you know, fellow veterans in our respective um, countries and, you know, being of service in that way. And, you know, women who tend to be called to, you know, male dominated environments in that way. I, I know a lot of alpha women struggle in that high functioning way, right? Where we have that external success and yet really struggle with that identity and, and confidence, like re genuine confidence and, and connecting to truly owning who we are in our own way, because quite often a lot of these badass alpha women don't fit into any of the molds. You know, we can gravitate towards these male dominated environments, but ultimately we're still women. And then we generally don't fit in with the other women either. And so we're kind of like always the black sheep. But as I've moved into entrepreneurship and leadership in general, like I see this with all alpha leaders across the board, right? They're very high functioning on the outside, you know, massive amounts of success with all this doubt and imposter syndrome and really struggling with 
anxiety or depression or just this extreme lack of fulfillment internally. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And I think also that that struggle and that doubt, you know, I, I also think that it's probably an indicator that we're not complete sociopaths quite yet. You know, the fact that we feel those doubts and fears, I think, you know, it reminds me that I'm human still. <laughs> um, you know, it. I'd like to think I'm a superwoman, but actually, um, you know, those feelings of vulnerability are what kind of keep me me. So um, whilst it would be lovely to not have any of those feelings, I don't necessarily think it's wrong or, you know, unhelpful. It's just when you learn to have a more healthy relationship, I think, with those feelings. Absolutely. So how has mindfulness, first of all, helped you bridge the gap in really connecting to your own true identity and confidence and, and success? Yeah, okay. Um, well, thank you for, for asking me that. Um, so... I use this phrase, which doesn't sound like much fun, but it's called distress tolerance, which is um, another way of, of phrasing acceptance, really. But acceptance almost sounds like you're surrendering, but actually it's more of a powerful acceptance. So I went through this period of really struggling with who I was and really kind of resisting it. Um, but then also feeling angry with the rest of the world for not loving me the way I was. And, and then I felt like I had to change and all this sort of stuff. And I was just so stuck fighting it all the time. And then I learned mindfulness. And one of the things about mindfulness is you just sit with that feeling. Um, and it, I was sort of sitting with this anger that I felt, actually. And I would just, just, I just learned to sit with it as opposed to fighting with it. And then when I did that, I realized that underneath the anger, actually, I was afraid of not being lovable. Um, and I was also a bit ashamed that I, I knew I could be quite tricky to be around and I was quite embarrassed about it. And I think also there was probably a bit of grief in there too, because suddenly you know you kind of when you're a little girl and you think everything's possible and you think that nothing bad ever happens and I think I was sort of grieving a little bit for this for this little girl who thought that nothing bad ever happened but it was only because I had learned to sit with those feelings that I was able to see beneath them um, and then when I was able to do that I just had a sort of different relationship with it and you know it's not to say that it's okay to act out in anger but because I changed my relationship with anger I wasn't fighting it anymore and I could see that underneath I had a need and I, and I had a fear and actually I think it's all right to be afraid I think all of us feel that fear um, and it's okay so it just it just allowed me to stop fighting um, and just kind of befriend my emotions so that was a real turning point for me. And that's what mindfulness gave me. And I call it stress tolerance. You can call it acceptance. You can call it whatever you like, but that's what I call it um, because it's that kind of leaning into difficulty. Um, and it, I guess it resonates with me because acceptance, like I say, it sort of feels a bit weak, whereas, you know, I'm a powerful woman. So I like the idea of you know, being able to tolerate difficulty, not because I have to, but because I can and because I choose to, and because I know that through that, I am getting closer to my values, which is where I want to be. Mm, that is so powerful. And it is amazing how much um, of this internal conflict really comes from the avoidance of discomfort, right? Like the avoidance of the discomfort of actually being present with what I'm feeling because we're so used to being in a state of action right? The hustle, the go, obviously for those of us, you know, veterans, like we know what it's like to be fully on, <laughs> yeah. you know, on, our, on our mission, but in entrepreneurship and leadership as well, right? We're always in this state of action or motion or hustle. And, and it was over the years of realizing how much I was truly addicted to avoiding discomfort. And so much mm. of this self-soothing was coming from just control or taking action or whatever. I don't want to be patient, right? Because that would be uncomfortable. So let me just do it myself, right? Like all of those ways that I was learning to just, nope, 
I could numb out with food, with drugs, with alcohol, with television or social media. And I would avoid with, with hustle and action. And I mm -hmm. love how you said that, right? Like really making friends with your emotions. I mean, I, you know, I say the exact same thing. I'm like, I just, I learn to make friends with the emotions and observe them as a messenger and like, oh, am I willing to receive the message of what it is that I really need to address, right? Yeah. So yeah, what, absolutely. what are some of the best steps, the tools or techniques that you utilize in stepping into what I love that you use, military-grade mindfulness? It's just... <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. But to step into that level of mindfulness um, when embracing the suck, right? Because obviously if we're sitting in some of those emotions, and I love that you brought up, brought up grief because I think that's one emotion that people experience a lot of and never identify, right? Like they, we're losing, we're, I mean, we're experiencing a loss, whether it's a loss of the life I thought I would live or the identity I was attached to with this label or whatever, but that there's this loss, this deep loss mm. through all of it. So explain what this military grade mindfulness is. Um, sure. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's why do I call it military grade mindfulness? Um, a couple of things. One is because it was born out of um, an environment which requires mental toughness. Well, or I certainly felt like I had to be mentally tough. Um, and it is what we make of it, of course. Um, so, um, and I had this idea that mindfulness was this, you know, I resisted it for a long time because I thought it was all a bit woo. Um, and I went down the cognitive behavioral therapy route, actually, because I preferred the idea of kind of analyzing my thoughts and changing my thoughts. And I know that works for a lot of people, but I just found I got stuck in my head doing that. So I think there were, I, had to, I had to reframe it for myself to make it acceptable for me to be able to do it. Because I was like, how can this helicopter pilot go and meditate? It's just not me. So I think part of it was just realizing that it was actually because of my military environments that mindfulness worked so well because you are constantly confronting difficulty um and how you relate to that you know can sort of make or break you so i think it's that you know it it, it led to the discovery of mindfulness but then also when i started really digging into mindfulness and coaching it a lot of people would come to me and say well you're a mindfulness coach but you must know about dealing with pressure as well so can you tell me how the two kind of relate to each other and I was thinking yeah no how does that work actually so I started thinking about all of my military training that I'd done and I realized that all of that training where we were being we were practicing being under fire or practicing aircraft emergencies or all of that stuff it was all training to make sure that our mind was where it needed to be in that moment and not distracted by fear or all the rest of it and we trained and trained and trained so that it would become automatic but ultimately it was so that we could have our attention where we wanted it to be and I realized well that's actually what mindfulness is so I realized that we were actually being taught we were actually practicing mindfulness you know in the cockpit of a helicopter which was a bit of a, a light bulb moment for me and it made me realize that mindfulness is so much more than just meditating and I think Meditation is brilliant, you know, it's like your hardcore gym session, you're trying to get fit. But equally, there are so many ways you can be mindful in very dynamic situations that I had completely overlooked. And I really want the world to know this so that they don't, like me, overlook mindfulness when actually it could be something that is absolutely helping them to be on their A game when everything is unraveling. And that's so true, right? Where the mindfulness is a a performance optimizer right it allows us to elevate our port performance our focus our productivity our flow and be able to better manage and navigate what were our, our thoughts and our feelings as we're just experiencing success failure triumph challenge 
war or business, which is absolutely, absolutely amazing. And so what have you found has been some of the, the different processes that, that you're engaging this mindfulness? Because I love how you described it. And it's like how you said, it's like way more than meditation. What are some of the different tools and techniques um, that you recommend for people who are beginning to step, bridge the gap into mm. mindfulness while not necessarily going down the realm of, you know, the quintessentially woo. Yeah. <laughs> the woo stuff, right? <laughs> All of us alpha high performers are like, oh, let's do woo for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the other one I hear all the time, and, and I have a lot of these conversations with people, is where they're like, I've tried meditation and it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, I'm doing yeah. it wrong or whatever. So, yeah. Um, so, so the, the basic process of mindfulness, um, if you're starting out, I suppose, I, I call it it's focusing and noticing. And I, I talk about this kind of dance between focusing and noticing. So noticing is, you know, where is my attention gone? And that's actually where the distress tolerance bit comes in, by the way, because you notice your thoughts have landed in a place where you're feeling pain or whatever it is. And you can choose to just accept that and, and observe it. So it's noticing. But then when you feel that you want to and it's right, then you go back to focusing. Go, right, where do I want my attention to be? So you're noticing where your attention has gone and you're focusing your attention where you want it to be. And um, Ruby Wax, who is my hero, she describes that process as a mental sit-up. Every time you bring your attention back to where you want it to be, you're doing a mental sit-up and you're exercising that mindfulness muscle. And it's interesting what you say about people think that they're meditating badly because they notice how often they're being distracted. But that's actually not the problem at all. It's actually... Um, you can't really meditate badly, in my opinion. Sorry, the six-year-old is now distracting me. <laughs> yes, it's enough. I just need to finish this, my love. Um, so I've just been distracted, okay? So I'm noticing my six-year-old son, and now I'm focusing back on you. But every time you do that, that is a mental sit-up. So you can't meditate badly, because we tend to go, I was distracted X amount of times, so therefore I'm terrible at meditating. The fact that you noticed you were distracted and you brought your attention back to whatever it is, often it's the breath when we start out, that's where the magic is. So you can do that, whether it's in a meditation, you can do that sat at your desk before you sit down to do your, you know, work. You know, I, I've just done it just now, you know, where I've been, I've noticed a distraction and then I brought my attention back to where I want it to be. So that is literally limitless. You can do that every waking moment of the day. And so a good idea if you're starting out is just to decide uh, what is my object of attention going to be? So where am I going to focus my attention? And then just, you know, practice that, um, you know, maybe like you say, sat down at your desk before you go to do your work. You can just say, right, I'm just going to spend a minute focusing on my breath. And every time I notice I've been distracted, that's fine. No judgment. I'm not doing anything wrong, but I'm bringing my attention back. Perfect. I love it. That is probably some of the most concise and simple and easy to implement instructions and understanding for not just meditation, but just mindfulness in general, like what it is and how to do it. So we are going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, we're going to get into perhaps one of the most amazing topics Sarah talks about, which is emotional constipation versus emotional incontinence. So stay tuned. <laughs> Go deeper by grabbing your copy of my best-selling book, Be a Boss and Fire That Bitch, by going to firethatbitchbook.com. Right. Welcome back to this powerful conversation with Sarah Furness, and we are talking all things mindfulness. So before the break, I mentioned your lovely topic, emotional constipation versus emotional incontinence. So I talk about emotional constipation a lot, but I loved when you brought in the emotional incontinence piece. I was like, yes, let's chat about this. So please explain. Um, yeah, okay. So this does get mixed reactions. It's a bit of a Marmite topic. Um, but I think we went from this emotional 
constipation um and you know particularly brits are kind of renowned for it really aren't they um it's where you know we we don't talk about our emotions we bottle them up um to emotional incontinence i actually read it in an article i stole the uh, phrase i didn't come up with it um where it's just the pendulum has swung so far the other way that now everyone's on social media you know there's emojis for every type of um emotion and everybody's sharing and sharing and sharing and sharing which of course it seems like a bit of a paradox that i'm fully supporting mindfulness awareness of emotions and also sitting with emotions and yet here i am talking about emotional incontinence so i need to be really clear what i mean about this um mindfulness is about um not judging not overly feeling the need to label and certainly not being too attached to something and i think that there's a, a certain concern i have that the more we talk about things actually we give that more energy so i think it's great to be able to acknowledge how we're feeling um but you know like a problem shared is a problem half for example but a problem shared 12 times is a problem magnified 12 times so there's a balance here um and i see that we needed to go from emotional constipation to kind of emotional fluidity i guess i don't don't quite know what the right word is um but if we talk about something too much and we give it too much of our energy and attention then actually that can be just as bad for us um and i think that there is so much emphasis at the moment you know understandably because a lot of people have you know found the last 18 months quite tough so there's a lot of emphasis on being able to talk about it and that is great but i think it needs to come with a bit of a health warning that less is more if that makes sense and i don't want to go back to emotional constipation um but it isn't just about it's about quantity not quality sorry quality not quantity i suppose does that make sense to you oh that makes perfect sense perfect sense yeah it's it, going from one extreme to, to the other neither equals emotional intelligence right emotional intelligence uh, great phrase yeah right like i mean it's it's just because we're word vomiting you know what we're feeling and what we're thinking you know i i love how you i mean really we go from one type of compartmentalization to another because like you said right we're still judging we're still labeling and we're finding unhealthy connection through this shared oh well this through this oversharing and sort of emotional vomiting on each other in the extreme and it's not for the purpose of learning about ourselves it's just putting it out there giving ourselves a label you know i love how everyone has some sort of mental health issue now which i i even think the term mental health is a disservice mm -hmm. to people not even really acknowledging like no this is just emotional coping that we're lacking right. <laughs> really i yeah. mean there there yeah. are a small number of people genuinely who have some biochemical imbalances in their body yes i'm not you know but the bulk mm. of people really it is about emotional intelligence self management self mastery healthy coping and when we are emotionally out of control whether it is the constipation or the incontinence it's it's really um a disservice to empowering ourselves to move forward when again we're mislabeling yeah the situation. and i i think disservice is a great word actually because it might sound quite um disrespectful for me to talk about emotional incontinence it's not you know it's not the the nicest phrase but actually i mean it with the highest respect i hold humanity in enormous respect i've seen how tough humans are and i feel like there's a narrative out right there right now that we aren't that we are fragile and that you know and i just think that it's very important to remember that we're, we're actually very resilient and very tenacious so i think disservice is is the perfect word to sum it up and i actually want to um to show some respect to humanity by 
by saying actually we're tougher than we think but if you talk about it all the time you will convince yourself because your brain is listening to the words you use and if you keep going on about how broken you are you will start to believe it and you'll start to feel it and, and be it well and i know this is a, a a passion topic for you about how our current climate within the wellness industry or wellness culture and I think I kind of segued in sort of talking about right the umbrella of mental health and it's like mm. yes we want to remove the stigma and be open to talk but yet at the same time and I know this is one of those big perspectives and we're kind of leaning into that right how easy it is for us to kind of then step into that victim mindset of well this happened to me so of course right like you said right we just uh, absorb into our identity this concept that we're broken or damaged or unlovable or incapable of mm. improving and elevating ourselves right like really empowering ourselves to be our the highest version we are called to be versus checking out with a label because i know that was an excuse i used for a long time i used to be like well i have ptsd so that gave me permission to be an asshole to people <laughs> Seriously, like I used that as my ticket to be a dick, to not show up, to cancel, to to disrespect other people's time, to be selfish. Mm. Because a lot of these, you know, cycles are are just very internal focused conditions. So inherently, mm. they they are a bit self focused. And again, this is with with no judgment whatsoever. Mm. This is mm. from someone who's walked the path. Like I yeah. know how self focused I was in a, in a very negative cycle when I was stuck in that place. And the more I removed the labels and began to empower myself, I was like, oh shit. Like you said, I'm stronger than I realized. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, I think that's, I mean, obviously I've read your book, so I know that you're very candid about it and you, and you share your experiences so that other people can learn. Um, but, you know, I'm right there with you. You know, I think I went, the pendulum swung too far for me the other way too. And I went from being kind of angry and like a tight little ball to I did become that victim too. And so that's why I'm passionate about both. And I'm passionate about this victim culture because I was there too. So again, it's coming from a position of empathy and understanding. Um, yeah, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm totally with you. You know, I, I went through that too. So when I talk about the pendulum swinging too far the other way, it's not, it's not I'm not judging at all. Um, and, and I wonder sometimes if that is part of, is that just how we adjust? Is that how it's, you know, it's revolution, not evolution. And we almost have to go too far one way for us to be able to find a equilibrium. Is that kind of part of it? You know, is that, is that, that for a lot of people, that is the journey they go on. So, and I suppose I'd love it if I could spare people that unnecessary suffering, either by being constipated or by being incontinent. Um, you know, if I can't, I can't, but I guess that's what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give people the, the straight line route um, that I had to, and you and I both sort of worked out the long way, I suppose. So true, right? It is. And then it does. It's, it's, and, and perhaps maybe that's where we're at, you know, collectively, that in the shifts we've had around the world over the last 18 months, and sort of in our culture in general, in bringing greater openness and awareness to, again, the umbrella of mental health that that's that is kind of that natural part of getting to the equilibrium is anytime we've been locked in one side it's it's the overcompensation to the other so for mm -hmm. me yeah the hard ass the control freak the type a over to the oversharing overly emotional um yeah, not not best version either of myself yeah. um, to get to that balanced place. 
And so maybe yeah. that's what it is. It's like somehow we're in a bit more of a collective experience of eventually getting to that middle ground. Yeah. And interestingly, um, as well, I have this um, this thought around, you know, female empowerment as well. And we're both, you know, ex-female military where we've both served in male-dominated environments. And I see a lot around female empowerment. And sometimes I think, you know, are we, are we pushing this too far? Is this positive discrimination now? Um, and I've been speaking to a colleague and, you know, we're, we're working together. And he said, um, you're, you're probably going to get hired for this because we need we need a female to sort of break things up a bit. Does that offend you? I went, no, I'm getting work because I'm a female. Why would that offend me? Um, but it's interesting. I'm like, you know, it's it's a complex, it's a complex um, scenario um, and, and he said, interestingly, um, he said, I think the pendulum has to swing too far the other way. I think we have to push. We have to push so that we find the equilibrium. And I think that's how change is made. So that was his view. Um, and I'm still working out if that's what we need to do or if we can you know, do it more kind of by, I don't know, marginal gains. But then I, I'm all about revolution or evolution, too. I think, you know, I think we can I think we can move things along, along a little bit. So. Yeah. What do you think about that? Absolutely. I, I think I feel like it's something that I love the momentum around the empowerment of women as a whole. And really, I feel a shift in women's empowerment where now it is becoming less about fighting against the external and about more focused on the internal, especially within the concept of community and sisterhood, which has definitely been lacking in women's empowerment. It was always fighting against rather than yeah. coming together. So I love yeah. how it's leaning more towards coming together now and how I've noticed that in women's empowerment, as we've removed fighting against we've also recognized how because it was always external it was focused on the emasculation of men and that has come with massive consequences yeah agreed and, and so where we can empower women collectively we can empower community and sisterhood while also supporting men reconnecting and re-embracing their healthy empowered masculine because again each of us internally has masculine feminine energy the world has masculine feminine energy and it needs to be in balance and I know as a strong empowered alpha woman that my ability to relax and step more and more into my feminine for example, within my home, comes from being with a, a, a man with strong, masculine, healthy, masculine energy. And that's important to have that balance at home and in the relationship. And obviously, you know, that is a heteronormative, you know, example. But regardless, right, that we don't have to emasculate women or emasculate men in order to empower mm. women. Yeah. Yeah. I, I well said. Thank you. <laughs> Something I've been working <laughs> on. <laughs> no, biggie. <laughs> no biggie. So before we get to where everyone can find you, I would love for you to just kind of wrap up today and leave the audience with some final thoughts. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I think the turning point for me and what I want everyone to have is um, this feeling of abundant choice. Um, I think it's really easy right now to feel like we're having our choices taken away from us. So much, you know, has been uncertain and there's been, you know, a lot of rules and laws, you know, in order to protect us. So I think it's really easy to convince ourselves we don't have any choices. Um, but the thing that absolutely changed my life was realizing I had a choice, even if it is down to where I focus my attention. Um, I always, always have a choice. I have a choice whether or not 
you know, to be an asshole and blame all of my anger on everyone else. Um, you know, and I might not have asked for some of the un unfortunate things that happened, but I still get to choose how I respond to that. So I think, you know, I want everyone to know that they have a choice and they're more powerful than they think. Um, and once you, once you become choice aware, you kind of can't turn that radar off. And then something really wonderful happens because then you want everyone else to have those choices. So you stop, you know, because I think also I was control free. So I was trying to control everyone else and get everyone else to change their behavior to make me feel happier. So I was taking other people's choices away because I didn't feel like I had choices. So I think, you know, it's all about choice for me. I think that is the root of all kind of happiness. Um, if you want to be happy, start owning your choices and, you know, and then let it all flow from there. Wow, that was so good. So powerful. Thank you so much. I completely agree, right? Really the empowering ourselves by focusing on what we have control over, which is just us. How am I choosing to show up? What am I choosing to say, to, to eat, to drink, to feed my soul, to think, to feel? What am I choosing? Who am I choosing to be? What am I choosing to do? And how am I choosing to lead to create the impact in the world that I want to see? So good. So where can people find you? Okay, so my website is wellbeitcoach.com. And if you go there, you find everything else because you'll find my social media channels, uh, my YouTube channel. Um, and I've also got a whole load of blogs and meditations on SoundCloud, uh, which are free. So there's a whole load of stuff that people can, um, can go to um, to start their mindfulness journey. Um, so my website is probably the first place. I'm also quite active on LinkedIn. So my handle for social media is Wellbeit Coach. So come and uh, come and say hi. Ask me any question. Disagree with me. Get the conversation going. Um, and I'd love to love to get to know you. Oh, so good. Absolutely. I love that that you know how we connected through our mutual community and uh, just immediately vibed with us. I was like, no, I have to have you on my podcast. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining me today. It has been an absolute pleasure having you on. That has been an absolute pleasure being on. And I have to say, I just absolutely loved your book. So if anyone is listening, hasn't read their book, then crawl out from under the rock that you're underneath um, and read the book. It's wonderful. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And of course, for those of you who are listening, if you've enjoyed today's episode, be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a review on your favorite platform and down download the influential app. And remember, as always, you are enough. And I will see you in the next episode.